What's up boys and girls, it's your boy Johnny aka Crew90 and it was recently brought to my attention that I've never actually explained how I lost my leg which is crazy because everybody knows I lost my leg in a bailer um, like what 9 million people have listened to my 911 call um, but with that being said like I've never actually explained why I was in the machine, how I was in the machine, um, why I was alone, why nobody called for help, etc. I've never actually done like a real story time. So uh, that's exactly what I want to do today. I want to tell the story of how exactly I lost my leg. So my idea is I want to start with a little bit of backstory just leading up to how I even ended up working at Smurf at Stone in the first place and why I was alone, alone that night. And um, to kind of explain that no, this wasn't a um, hay baler as a lot of people assume this wasn't some sort of agricultural accident because um since i haven't really ever explained it a lot of people just have to go off of what they know and the only type of baler they know of is like something to do with farming but no this was an industrial baler um at a recycling plant and i was actually baling cardboard but so anyways for those of you not fully invested you don't care that much um you can go ahead and hit the description box right now and scroll down there will be a timestamp that will take you directly to the part of the video specifically focusing on the night of the actual accident july 9th 2010 but for everybody else who wants to hear kind of like the leading up part of it um here we go so um story starts at uh february 2010 so it was actually um very early february 2010 i was 19 and uh, i responded to an ad on craigslist uh they were looking for somebody to work at a recycling plant to do like sorting for trash so um i was i responded to the ad i went to the interview passed the background check passed the drug test and um found out very quickly that the actual ad wasn't placed by the company um that that like the recycling company that needed the workers it was placed by a temp agency called pro logistics and they specialized in um like blue collar manual labor type of work basically they were glorified day laborers which wasn't a big deal i was actually doing day labor style work um not even like six months before so um this was perfectly fine for me i don't know like even like four months before but um you basically you would go to your gig it would usually be anywhere from like a nine to twelve hour day you'd get paid um directly into your account that day and then you would log into your portal and you would find um the following day's gigs and based on your qualifications and first come first serve availability you could sign up to work the following day and so like i said basically it was day laboring work and so um, Millie, that was my contact at Pro Logistics, um, Millie specifically told me that the job for recycling wasn't actually available yet, but to just hang out and um, when it was available, they let me know, but to go ahead and just pull other jobs in the meantime. So for the next two weeks, I bounced all around Central Florida doing anything that you could think of manual labor wise. Um, and I was as far south as like South Point Siena down near Disney. Like at one point I heard Mickey Mouse in my background telling me I was doing a good job. And I would go as far north as like North Sanford and um, at the time i lived in lockhart which if you're familiar with central florida then you know i was in the heat all right i was i was lived in lockhart uh, riverside forest city i was like a stone's throw away from uh eatonville i was right up the road from ivy lane edgewater high school all that stuff so um yeah i lived in lockhart but anyways um so uh, i would drive like anywhere from i was driving like 50 minutes to you know some like i think the closest thing i went to was like a 45 minute drive sometimes i was going as much as an hour and 15 minutes away to get to these locations but i loved it i, I worked in warehouses i did general like cleanup at construction sites i worked at a train yard and this is what i felt like at the time was like manly work it was like i was a grown-up because prior to this um you gotta remember i was 19 prior to this i'd only ever done like retail work and fast food i worked at a cookie store i worked at bojangles five guys i was a shirtless model for for Abercrombie in New York um actually yeah that was that was a pretty cool job I worked at the South Street Seaport location and um, I was one of those guys that got paid to just stand around without a shirt on in like a pair of board shorts and greet people as they walked in um totally different lifetime but anyways um this was like my first where I felt like it was like a real job I was earning my money and I really liked that and so um, I loved it. But after about two weeks, Millie called me and she said that the um, recycling plant was ready for me to show up on Monday. Monday was actually March 1st. So on March 1st, I would start at Smurfit Stone. So I pulled in on March 1st and um, 
what, what I found out was Smurfit Stone was the recycling company, but they rented their space from WSI, which was the actual trash company. And I don't remember what WSI stood for. It was something like Waste Services Incorporated or Waste Services Industries or something like that. I just call it WSI for We Severely Injure. But um, WSI was like the actual garbage trucks that would go out and collect trash and they had all the residential places in the area, but they also had like a lot of commercial contracts. They had the jail, Johnny Polk Correctional Facility that was right up the road. They had um, the Florida Mall, the Mall of Millennia. Uh, they had like the outlets. They had all these like like really cool businesses in the area and we'd get all their trash and we'd see some crazy stuff come through the trash. I can make videos just about that if I wanted to. And um, also like one really cool thing, uh, whenever like the high-end stores at the mall at Millennia were throwing out product that they couldn't sell, um, they were supposed to destroy it and then throw it out. And um, it was so rare that it would actually happen like that. Usually they would just pick the stuff up, put it right into the trash, and then um, it, would, it would come down the line. So we were finding like bags filled with belts and, and wallets from Issey Laurent or purses from like Coach. We found shoes from Prada. I'm talking mint condition. The girls that worked there would go crazy over this stuff. I got a wallet, I believe. Um, but I also got like, a, I got a hoodie at one point. Um, just really cool stuff. But anyways, so I started there and I found out right off the bat the reason that there was um, a delay for me to actually be at Smurfit Stone was because um, like uh, the pro logistics would send the employees out. We referred to ourselves as prolos to separate us from the Smurfit Stone employees who we just referred to as Smurfits. But um, the prolos would come out, they'd work Monday through Friday. Um, and then they would work uh, again like a half day on Saturday and if you didn't do like a really good job then the um, Smurfit Stone boss he wouldn't call you back for the following Monday so it was like wave by wave basically prolos would show up they'd work the week and then maybe they'd come back on Monday or other prolos would replace them and so basically they were waiting for um, prolos to get let go so that other prolos could come in so I started that Monday with myself Quan Carlito and D Love. His, his real name was Derek, but I actually knew him outside of Pro Logistics. His name was, we called him D Love. But, anyways, there was all obviously other prolos already there, but us four were the ones that started on that particular wave. And um, we just we went right into it. And for the first two weeks, I just busted my butt and really put like, you know, my best effort out there. And the bosses really noticed it and they started telling me I had a strong work ethic and they really wanted to get me off of like ground sorting, which was just the most menial labor you could imagine. It's exactly what it sounds like. They would dump trash onto the ground and like 10 or so of us would scramble up the trash and start pulling out anything recyclable. We all had a specific material we were looking for. Like I might be pulling out cardboard, someone else aluminum, someone else plastic, etc. And um, once everybody pulled out their material, all that would be left was just the just the standard trash which would be pushed into the incinerator and then we would do it all over again but within two weeks they'd already said that they, I had too much potential they really didn't want me wasting my 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 I don't want to keep saying the word potential but they didn't want me to be wasting my potential on um, just doing that so they moved me up I was on the belt sorter and it was like the sorting line basically in the sort house and that was predominantly smurfits that worked in there and um, I did that for a couple weeks and by um, like early April I already had a walkie talkie which was a pretty big deal because only Smurfits had walkies no prolos did so um, it was pretty cool and um, every Monday you'd show up and you'd look to see what prolos had been let go and always without fail at least two or three prolos were gone and some two or three new prolos were there D love got cut out relatively quickly um, me and Carlito and Quan stayed on for a while but around mid-March I mean I'm sorry mid-April Carlito got quit got got cut and um, Richie, who you might remember from the 911 call, he was the bailer operator. He um, ended up taking over Carlito. Carlito was forklift certified, and they decided they didn't want to bring in another forklift operator from Pro Logistics. They wanted to just use one of their actual Smurfit employees. So Richie moves over to the, the forklift. And that leaves the bailer operator position available. So they decide to start training me on the bailer. Now there was another girl that worked there and she also knew how to do the bailer. She didn't do it very much. She was basically just like a backup bailer operator um, for like when we were on break or like if somebody called out. But um, she started training me and for about two weeks, I ran the bailer under her supervision while um, she taught me what I was needed to do. And then um, Richie was now working as the forklift operator. Um, in early May, uh, Richie ended up going away on paternity leave for about two weeks and um, the girl basically just disappeared and left me alone. 
And so I ran the baler completely on my own with only like maybe two, two and a half weeks of training tops. And, um, but I was running it and I, I did really well. I picked it up very quickly. We had a quota. Um, we worked in blocks, which were 15 minute sections, um, four blocks per hour. You had to do three bales per block, basically a bale every five minutes. Um, I had no problem doing that and um, would routinely do even up to four or five bales per block. So I was knocking out anywhere from 16 to 20 bales an hour um, when my quota was 12. And so Richie came back from paternity leave and uh, they were very impressed with me and they wanted to see if they could start a second shift so the baler would run um, even more per day. So they would make the girl become an actual full-blown baler operator. She would work the normal shift 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then we would come in at 4 p.m. We would be the night shift and we would work from 4 to 11. And um, I would be the baler operator for the night shift. Richie would be my forklift operator. And then another Smurfit named Jeff, he was going to be my front end loader operator. So this was a major cut in hours because I went from getting paid nine hours a day, Monday through Friday, plus six hours on um, Saturday to only working, you know, seven hours a day, Monday through Friday and six hours on Saturday. Um, but it came with a huge pay increase because they were going to buy me out of my um, pro logistics contract and make me an actual smurf at stone employee so i was about to go up like five dollars an hour so at the end of a week even losing all of that overtime that i would be losing i was going to actually be making about 200 dollars more per week so i was stoked this was a huge promotion um also the bosses were only there until five all the other employees were only there till five so basically the majority of my shift would just be me richie and jeff and me and richie had become super good friends at this point so like i was super excited i'm going to be working every day with just me and two other people one of whom is like one of my best friends i'm making a lot of money um i was making a lot of money back then and um, I'm, I just turned 20, so I mean, I'm like, I'm young. Like, it was really good. So um, in mid-May, they started this second shift. They called it the night shift, but uh, it wasn't really a night shift. And that was how it was. And so from four to five, from four to five, we'd be working with like everybody there. Around five, everybody would leave, including the bosses. And from five to 11, it would just be me, Richie, and um, Jeff. And I loved it, and that's what we did. Um, there was nobody else on the plant. And that's why on the night of my accident, um, nobody really knew what was going on. So flash forward to July 9th, 2010. Um, at this point, I have been doing the second shift for about a month and a half. I've been running the baler for a little over two months and um, I'm very good at it. I am like not to, to toot my own horn, but you know, I am absolutely one of the best baler operators that that plant had ever seen. They told me it on a regular basis. At this point, I'm doing seven bale blocks consistently every block through my entire shift. Like I am more than doubling my quota. Um, they are super happy with my performance. Um, and uh, basically we were on a trial run to make sure that the shift was, was gonna be productive enough to um, account for itself and then um, they were gonna promote me. So that night, Friday night, was the last, I wasn't supposed to work Saturday, I had the weekend off for once. That was the last day I was supposed to work as a prolo. And on Monday, I was officially starting as a Smurfit. And so um, that weekend, I was gonna go out and party and just kind of celebrate my raise and my promotion and what I felt was me finally starting off as, li as, as in, in life, you know? And um, I had my own, my own place with a roommate, and we had actually gone out the night before one of his friends had came into town we'd been up late and just life was looking really good that friday night it started to rain while i was at work whenever it rained the machine became very hard to operate because it ran off of sensors based on weight and so how much product was inside of the hopper was based off of how heavy the hopper was how much product was on the belt how much product was already in your chamber etc all these things were based on weight if you're bailing cardboard cardboard is soaking up water from the rain especially if it's raining really hard none of that um none of that equipment is of any use because it's it's giving you measurements based on inaccurate information because it's telling you maybe that you have you know two tons worth of cardboard in your chamber but you only actually have maybe a ton and a half maybe even not maybe like a ton and a quarter the rest of that is pure water weight and the um the cardboard just soaking up all the water so you have to start doing it by eye you have to start actually like looking at everything and making proper guesstimates and this was not the first time i worked in the rain i was very familiar with this it was it's, it's florida it's the summer it's it rains all the time like i was familiar with it 
However, normally you can tell when you have thicker cardboard on your chamber because the weight ends up being elevated. So you can look and say, wow, that looks like a really heavy, um, like on your, on your, on your feeder, you could be like, that looks like a really heavy load that's about to drop into the, um, into the, the chamber, into the belly. Um, doesn't look like there's that much material but the the gauges are saying it's really heavy okay and then you know it's very thick cardboard it's either corrugated cardboard or it's some of the wax cardboard etc usually you could tell this particular night it was showing me heavy readings but i don't you know i have no way of knowing that it's because of that in my mind it's just because everything is soaking wet with water the readings have been through the roof all night so i ended up dropping what what ended up being too much cardboard into the hopper but um the hopper the chamber the belly however you want to call it it's all the same thing it's where the material actually went down into i dropped too much material in because i didn't realize it was actually the proper amount of material but because it was thicker cardboard i should have only done a little bit and i ended up dropping a full load because i didn't know it's thick cardboard until it actually fell and i could physically see it up close i thought the weight differential from a normal load to this load was because of the water so um I started running the machine really slow so as to not jam it but first of all it's really easy to jam when the cardboard's wet in the first place because it comes all it becomes almost like a paper mache material um like a like a sludge um but also now i have the thicker cardboard it was not long before the machine jammed and i knew right off the bat this was going to be a bad jam it was going to take me forever to fix and um part of my job was to fix jams so i go ahead and I open it up and I look inside and I assess the situation and I know this isn't gonna be a quick fix. So um, I shut the whole machine down, I lock it out, I tag it out, I, I bleed the line, I have it completely closed off. Richie comes around on the forklift, he's like, is everything good? And I tell him, I jammed the machine, I gotta fix it. And I say, how about you and Jeff go on break? Cause we were due for a break soon anyways. I said, you guys go on break. There's no point in you standing around for probably 20, 30 minutes while I do this. And then we go on break. You might as well just go on break now. And um, I'll just I'll just work through my break, fix the jam, and we'll get back up and running in about 30 minutes. So Richie and Jeff, they go off um, all the way to the far other side of the plant because the baler is tucked in the very back of the plant, almost in like the far corner, and the break area is all the way up near the front. So they hop on Jeff on um, Richie's forklift and they ride up to the front and leave me alone on the machine. And I proceed to start working it out. You have to basically unlock and untag it out, um, back it up, pull some. Uh, Pull, lock it out and tag it out again get in there pull cardboard make room for like the blades and the the, the ram to go through come back out unlock it out untag it out run it through see if it broke if it didn't break lock it out tag it out again go back in it's a process you keep jumping in and out and in and out and every time you enter the machine you have to lock it out and tag it out um, and bleed the line of excess energy and so I'm doing this and it's a tedious process and it's not breaking and I'm in there and I'm pulling pieces and I finally, after like 20 something minutes, I finally see the piece of cardboard that I think is actually causing the jam. It's the, the cardboard that's really causing the problems. It was this really thick piece of wax coated, um, corrugated cardboard that was sticking up a little bit over the, the blades and the blades were dull. So basically anything sticking up over the blades, um, the ram should push it into the blades and then that material will break off on top. Um, but the blades were dull and this was really thick so it was just hitting it and instead of breaking it was just stopping the ram. I felt like that was the piece I needed to get it down and then it would be good. And as I'm looking at it I hear it kind of sound like the engines kick back on and it went almost like when a car goes from neutral to drive it's very imperceivable but if you know what you're listening for you'll hear it. I basically heard that and I looked immediately and uh, there was nobody in the control room. The machine should have still been locked out and tagged out. I had no idea how the machine was, sounded like it was coming on, but then the ramp started to move towards me. And I realized really quick, I don't have time to figure it out why it's happening. Bottom line is it's happening. The ram is coming towards me and um, I am standing inside of the machine on the bottom. I am, it's not like everybody's like, how did you get your foot into a machine? Because they're thinking of like a vertical um, baler, like maybe you'd see at a grocery store. This is a full industrial size baler. You um, like the thing runs along the ground. Um, you're pushing out like two or three ton bales. Um, you have so much material in there. And like when you're inside of the chamber, you are standing in there and the entryway is literally above your head. You are fully inside of the machine. My entire body was inside of the machine as I was supposed to be because I was trained to fix these jams. I was inside of the machine that I entered through the entry port designed for you to enter into. 
Um, so the machine, the, the ram is coming at me and it comes to about here and it would basically have pushed me up against the blades and crushed me here, cut me in, not even in half, probably cut, cut two thirds of me off, leaving just like from here up, done. I would have been dead either way, regardless. I would have been crushed to death on those blades. Um, I would have died. And so I knew I had, I had no time to, to, to falter or think, to be like, oh my gosh, I had to get up. So I jumped up on top of the ram and um, jumped for the entry door. And um, I, I made it to the door and I was pulling myself up and out of the way. And I was going to let the ram go underneath me and then drop down on it, kind of restabilize myself and then go back through the door properly. Um, but it caught the sole of my work boot and pulled my foot down pulled it under and then snapped my ankle off right there it snapped it at the shin above the ankle and like in a matter of seconds I watched as my foot just kind of disappeared out of sight under the blades and then boom it was snapped off and um, it happened really fast I almost didn't have a second to process it and then I realized like holy shit my foot is gone and I'm just looking at a stump where my foot used to be and I'm sporting out blood everywhere but here's the irony my foot ended up being what was needed to push that last piece of cardboard through. So the jam broke, which meant instead of just going and going and going until it stopped itself, because once it hit too much PSI, it would automatically kill. Um, the, the machine would automatically kill, not it would automatically kill me, even though it was trying to. Um, normally it would have just stopped and then it would have been just still and that would have given me time to come out but because the jam broke it now completed a full cycle and the ram was going to back up again and if it backed up it would drop me down to the bottom and then i'm now all around the bottom with one leg bleeding out everywhere there'd be no way i'd be able to get back up again and when it came back forward again it was going to push me through all the way i was now i would be completely crushed into the bale and the thing would continue to run in its cycle and continue to push they probably wouldn't even know where my body was until they finally realized what happened and pulled the bale out so i knew i had literally like maybe four or five seconds until this ram started backing up again i had to get myself up off of my butt and get through that window and so i forced myself to stand up i kind of slid back on my blood and i i made a mad jump for the entry window i grabbed it i pulled myself through i spilled out onto the floor of the control room i could see down below me as the ramp started to back up again i was literally seconds away from being dropped all the way down um instinctively i hit the emergency stop button part of me knew if i hit the stop button it would make the machine stop making noise and maybe if they heard it starting to make noise and then stop again they would think that um you know something was up and would come over even though it had been starting and stopping this whole time as i was trying to fix the jam part of me i think it was just emergency stop button is for emergencies and this is an emergency i'm not sure but i hit the emergency stop button and um then i sat there trying to figure out what to do i grabbed the walkie talkie and um i was actually at this point i was still standing i wasn't sitting yet i grabbed the walkie talkie and i yelled onto the walkie talkie i just had my leg cut off somebody call 911. I tossed the walkie-talkie onto the desk and then I sat down completely um, all of my energy gone I was I was done I had nothing left in the tank then the lady on the walkie-talkie because my two guys didn't bring their walkie-talkies or turned them off we're not sure they did not hear my call but some lady at an entirely different company heard my call if you listen to the 911 call you can hear somebody in the background that's her yelling at me through the actual cb radio basically it was like a giant walkie-talkie receiver and then we had like a handheld thing like truckers would use she's yelling at me that's not a funny joke this is for a professional line only you not call and say that you have that you have an accident you don't call for 911 um go get your parents blah 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 basically she thought i was a kid playing around and proceeded to yell at me to the point that you can actually hear it in the 911 call. But she was yelling at me and yelling at me and yelling at me rather than sending help. I didn't have the strength to stand back up and grab the walkie talkie and be like, yo woman, this isn't a joke, I'm dying. So I thought, well, I don't know what to do. Then I remembered my cell phone was, was in the desk within reach. So I grabbed it, cradled it, pinched off my, um, and basically I have a receipt. So I, I was cradling the phone like this and I was holding my leg the stump of my leg with my hands and I called 911. She eventually stopped yelling at me and just turned her radio off and then the rest is history. I spoke on the phone with the dispatchers all the way up until Richie finally came back from break and found me and that's when he was like whoa 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 and then he ran out 
what was going on behind the scenes is they really couldn't find me. Everybody's always arguing in the comments. They knew exactly where he was from the very first time that he gave the address. They just do that to keep him alert. No, you're wrong. They didn't know where I was. Um, I interviewed Jeff and I interviewed Chris Barrett, who are, Jeff was the dispatcher, Chris Barrett was the first responding officer. They will both say the same thing. They did not know where I was. They had no clue. They could not find me. Chris actually pulled into Smurf at Stone um, around the four minute mark, but he saw Richie and Jeff just up front smoking cigarettes and eating sandwiches. Nothing was going on, so he turned around and left. They didn't know why a cop had just pulled in, so they were like, oh, okay. But they didn't think anything was going on. He was continuing to drive around. Dispatch could not find me because I had said I worked at Smurf at Stone, which I did. Well, I actually worked at Pro Logistics, but whatever. But Smurf at Stone, like I said, was renting from WSI. The baler itself was a WSI baler. There was no Smurf at Stone. There was WSI. Now, yeah, you can Google it or you can find it on Yelp. It's also 11 years later. At that time, there was no record for, for Smurf at Stone. And I wasn't saying WSI. They could not find me. So I'm sitting there dying. And eventually, Chris Barrett, got, he just got this overwhelming hunch that he had been in the right location and he needed to go back there. So he drove back to the spot and he called out to Richie. And he's like, is there a kid here named John? And Richie's like, yeah, he's working, he's working the baler. And Chris immediately said, get in the car, take me to the baler. So Richie gets in, they drive across the plant to the baler. Richie jumps out um, because at that point, you know, the baler is dead silent. I guess he had a feeling something was going on. There's a cop here. He ran up the stairs and into the control panel because you sit above the belly of the, the machine, above the chamber. So you have to run upstairs to get to the control panel. He flings the door open. That's where you hear him find me. Um, he went sheet white. Um, Richie was from Guyana, so like he had color on him. He went whiter than me. And he was like, well, and then he ran back out and was like, he's in there, he's in there. And that's when Chris comes in and I start talking to Chris and the famous line that everybody loves to say where they said, how many officers are there with you? And I say, this is a bailing machine. I was talking to Jeff on the phone and Chris in person at the same time. But, um, and then yeah, Chris basically bear hugged me because they couldn't get the stretcher in the tight corridors of the, of the stairwell and the doorway. So Chris bear hugged me and then fireman carried me all the way down the stairs into the stretcher. And then I actually was, was in the ambulance. I lost consciousness. Um, I died in the ambulance and then I ended up at the hospital and now here we are. So um, when I said the, you know, any of my coworkers call and they were like, no, nobody called. It's not because they didn't care. It's because they didn't know. And um, in that moment, I did throw some shade and I was like, oh, I love these guys. Um, I couldn't understand why they didn't call. I couldn't understand why they didn't respond to my walkie talkie. But um, little did I know they didn't have it on them or they had turned it off. Um, the girl that heard my 911 or my, my distress call on the walkie talkie, she ended up calling 911 about 20 minutes later and just said that she wasn't sure if maybe it had been a real call. Um, she came forward. She worked for a company called Abby Tibby. I won't say her name because she may still work there. Um, but she worked for Abby Tibby. She felt really bad when she found out the situation, as she should. Um, Jeff got a life-saving award for his expertise on the 911 call. Um, Chris got really no recognition, but um, he stayed really good friends with me. To this day, me and Chris talk. We text each other regularly. Um, it's been 11 years since my accident and me and Chris still are like super close. He's no longer on the police force. He now lives up um, in north of the United States, up very far north. He basically went off grid, so I'm not going to give away where he's at. But um, he, uh, he is still a very big part of my life. Jeff, of course, is still a huge part of my life. But, um, but yeah, my recovery process was really simple. Um, I, I recovered really fast. Um, I was determined to not let it shape who I was. Um, the hardest thing that I, I discovered was walking on grass because it was so spongy and then beach sand. And the funny thing is, um, I have 11 years of being an amputee now and I still struggle to walk on beach sand. Um, the hard pack sand is fine, but the sugar sand, I still need somebody to help me walk on it because I barely can walk on sugar sand. But at this point I can run, I rock climb, I play sports. Um, I walk around so well that most people don't even know that I'm missing a leg if I'm wearing pants. So um, ultimately I'd say I came out pretty good. But so there you go, that is the story of how I lost my leg. Um, that is what happened from start to finish. And um, I can't really think of what else to say. So as always, this is your boy Johnny, AKA Crew 90. I'll catch you next time.
I can't believe that I forgot to mention two things. I'm over here saying that that was everything I needed to say and uh, I signed off for the video, but obviously everybody's gonna wanna know, um, well, why did the machine start up if it was locked out and tagged out? And uh, I can't believe I didn't mention that. So OSHA investigated and OSHA determined that um, the machine had faulty wiring. Some of the wires were crossed. And so basically, even when the machine was locked out and tagged out and should have been getting no electricity, um, it was still fully functional. The electricity was still running perfectly properly. And this was why up until even like a couple days beforehand, I had been filing incident report after incident report about the machine shutting itself down. This had actually triggered OSHA and Westbrook to come out. Westbrook was like, uh, um, they did like repairs and stuff to come out and do an investigation on the machine that Monday and um, fully look at the machine. And it was basically stated, if the machine can shut itself off, the machine can start itself up, which I'm not an electrician. I don't know exactly how accurate that was, but obviously it, it, it paid true in this instance because literally four days later on Friday, that's exactly what happened. So the machine was, um, it was locked out and tagged out. Ugh, wish I hadn't forgotten to do this. It was locked out and tagged out and um, it started itself up due to faulty wiring and um so that was that and then i remembered something else that i had forgotten to say as well i also wanted to state that i was not high at any point or drunk during the accident people always say that i must have been drunk or high and that's why i thought i was going to go to jail and that's also why i was so calm i thought i was going to go to jail because this was like a multi-million dollar machine and i just basically in my mind broke it um really the machine broke me and um i was calm because i i had like if i panicked i was gonna die also endorphins kick in um there's a lot of go stuff that goes on but um i was not drunk or high osha um investigated and um one of the first things that happened was i was drug tested at the hospital i came back completely clean nothing in my system whatsoever um it was 100 percent determined to be employer negligence um, they had faulty machinery. They had numerous safety things that they had removed that I didn't even know should exist, nonetheless were removed. They didn't have a Leary system. There was supposed to be an internal emergency stop button inside of the chamber that wasn't there. There was supposed to be a ladder that I should have been able to climb up and out of that would have gotten me out faster. There was so many different things that they, they didn't do properly. And um, they got fined one of the largest fines OSHA had ever levied against the company up to that date. And they actually had to file bankruptcy because they, they, they were found so heavily to be at fault. I was not at fault. So anyways, um, now that's everything I have to say. As always, it's your boy Johnny, aka Crew90. Catch you next time. Goodbye. For real this time. Goodbye. I'm back. I remembered one more thing. I kept saying that the front end operator's name was Jeff. Jeff did actually work there as a front end operator, but he worked there um, as the day crew. And um, when I went, moved to night shift, it was actually a guy named Dave. So the night crew was me, Richie, and Dave, not Jeff. Jeff was still front end operating over on day crew. Anyways, for the final time, it's your boy Johnny, AKA Crew90. Goodbye.